Okay. Hi, everybody. Erin Johnson here with the Outstanding Ohio Webinar of the Month. And this month's topic is the top 10 mistakes that home sellers make and how to avoid them. So um, before we jump in too much here, I'm just going to do a quick introduction on me. Again, Erin Johnson. I'm with EXP Realty. I specialize in the Copley Fairlawn Bath area, but willing and able to serve most of Northeast Ohio. I grew up in Fairlawn and um, after college in Vermont. I returned to Ohio. I lived on the east side for a bit. I lived in Lakewood for a while. I lived in Medina for quite a few years. And now I'm back living in Fairland with my husband and two teenage daughters. So with that, we're going to jump right in. So I'm going to give you today in the next hour, an overview of the selling process. And along the way, I'm going to highlight these 10 mistakes that home sellers make. So they're not in order, the mistakes are not in order of like which one's the biggest, but just kind of in order of the process. And just to give you a heads up, we're gonna spend the most time on steps one through four. So if you feel like, oh my gosh, it's halfway through and we're only on three, like, don't worry, we will be done in an hour or probably less. Um, but those are the more kind of upfront, heavier lifting uh, parts of the process. So the first part is just, this sounds kind of stupid, but deciding to sell, like, you know, how is the market? Should you sell and should you buy yourself first? So that's kind of the big pre-step to, to selling. And um, sorry, uh, mistake number one, right out of the gate is sellers trying to time the market. And I tell my buyers and my sellers that you are not, um, you are not playing the stock market here. This is your life. You need to make your move when it is best for you. Because, you know, I was just reading an article, for example, about people that sold and then they rented for a while thinking, well, prices are surely going to drop. Well, what's happened? Prices have gone up. Interest rates have gone up. Like that was maybe not their best move. They thought it was at the time. So you just, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do and what's best for you, because this is, is, although a very big investment, it's also your life in your family's life and what's convenient for you. But with that being said, you know, of course, the question on everybody's mind is how is the market? A big piece of that is it depends. It depends a little bit on the area, on, of course, the condition of your home and the price point. So certain price points, certain areas are moving quicker than others. But my experience has been still, if the house is in good condition and it's priced well, we're still seeing a lot of it goes under contract in a weekend, multiple offers over ask but it's maybe two offers instead of 10. It's maybe a couple thousand dollars over ask instead of $20,000 over ask. So it is settling down a little bit, um, but kind of those best properties are still going quickly. And um, this chart shows, this is Copley Fairland Bath, uh, the last four plus years, days on market, average days on market. So you'll see pretty consistently they were going down, down, down. And then kind of the middle of last year, they were starting to creep back up a little bit. And they are a little bit higher now than they were last year, but still very low. 54 days on market is still very low. Um, so still selling very quickly. The sales prices are starting to settle down a bit, but they are not by any means like falling out. And again, this is the last four years, Copley, Fairland, Bath. And this is pretty similar data to, to most places in Northeast Ohio. If you have a particular city or county that you want me to look at, I'm happy to do that. Um, but you'll see consistently, steadily increasing average price per square foot over the last four years. And it is still increasing um, compared to last year. It's not necessarily increasing as much on a month over month basis. So, you know, December was 135, January 137, February 131. Um, so it's starting to kind of settle in a little bit where we're not seeing these huge double digit year over year increases, but still showing increases. So the prices are still pretty strong. And they're expected to continue to rise on a year over year basis. Um, so although they might not be rising on a month over month basis, like I said, the year over year, probably more single digit increases instead of, you know, 10, 20 percent increases, but the prices are still strong. And, you know, people will ask, is it the right time to sell? And the, the short answer is yes. And again, it really houses are going to sell at any time of year. And um you know, there is some seasonality where there's going to be more houses available for sale. So more houses are going to sell in that period. You're also going to have more competition for what that's worth. Um, I had a couple that I helped our family that they were building and they were trying to time their selling to when their house was going to be done. And the way it worked out was basically Christmas time. Like, and so we had a long conversation. We, we ran some numbers to look at, should they list before Christmas or after Christmas? And what would that mean for them? Um, 
And, you know, you'll see, yeah, there's a lot less houses uh, for sale in December, um, but they still sell. And um, the inventory is so low right now also that basically at any time it's going to sell. So we look at the last four years, look at this, like four years ago, any given month, there was a hundred homes for sale between Copley, Fairland and Bath. And then it was 80, then it was 70, then it was 40. This year so far, 3522. Like it is so low that when those houses hit, they're getting snatched up if they're if they're decent, right? And priced priced sharply. Um, it hasn't really affected how many houses have sold in a given month. So there's still, you know, this chart's kind of crazy, but my takeaway here is that regardless of the inventory being so low, we're still pretty consistently, depending on the time of year, selling between 20 and 40 houses on any given month in the Capley Fairland Bath area. So um so don't necessarily be like, oh, well, I need to wait till spring or, you know, summer's better. Yeah, there might there might be more house. You're also going to have more competition. And there is always some motivated buyers out there looking to buy. OK, so mistake number two is not having a strategy for timing that buying and the selling. So assuming, you know, if you're selling, I'm assuming you're probably buying, not always, maybe you're building Maybe you have a second home that you're just going to move into or you're moving in with family or um, you're going to an assisted living or something like that. But typically, if you're selling, you're probably also um, buying. And so one of the big questions is, should you buy first or should you sell first? And I've kind of boiled this down into a decision matrix that kind of comes down to three questions. One, can you afford to buy without selling first? Two, can you live in the home while it's still listed? And three, do you have someplace else to live and are you okay with moving twice? So we're gonna dig into, <clears throat> excuse me, that a little bit. The first being around, can you afford it? So um, do you have money for the down payment and the closing costs on the new house without having the proceeds of selling your existing house? And once you've done that, do you have enough money and income to pay for two mortgages for a period of time? Now, with the way the houses are selling so quick, you literally might not ever see two mortgages at one time, but we can't guarantee that. So, you know, it would be best if you knew that you had the money to afford that for a couple of months, let's say. Um, but a key piece of this, because that sounds daunting, like, oh my gosh, how would I have that money, um, is that... Down payments, you might be thinking in your head 20%. You can get loans for somewhere between zero and 5%, depending on if you're a veteran, um, a teacher, a police officer, there's certain professions that can qualify for, for lower down payments. Um, but even a conventional loan, you can get for a 5% down payment. So it doesn't have to be 20%. And there's more solutions out there than you may be aware of in terms of like, you probably maybe you just don't have it sitting in the bank, ready to go, 10,000, 20,000, whatever it is. Um, and you may be kind of like, well, I don't know if I wanna cash out my investments. That doesn't seem like a wise move, but you could. Um, but the other thing you can do is borrow from your 401k. And you just basically pay yourself back. You know, you, you there's a certain amount of time that you can do that for, and there's and a maximum that you can do and so forth. So of course, talk to your financial advisor, but that's an option that a lot of people aren't aware of that could um, be a good solution for you to get that money. You can also do a home equity line of credit. If you have somebody that's willing to give you a gift, uh, if you have some uh, maybe personal possessions you can sell to get some money. So there are some different solutions to try to get that money up front. But the bottom line is, is that you must be able to carry the two mortgages because you're, the, the lender is not going to give you the loan, even if you have the money for the down payment and the closing costs, if you don't have enough um, debt to income ratio and income to make those payments for a period of time. So um, the second question is, can you live in the home while it's listed? So four questions underneath this one are, are you comfortable with people coming into your house? And either you are or you aren't, you know, kind of COVID stuff aside, I think we're mostly past that. But, you know, if you're comfortable with people coming in with all your possessions still there and so forth, um, and if you're not, you're not. So um, just consider that. Secondly, can you declutter? And we're going to go into some depth about what I mean by that. And then once it's decluttered, can you keep it that way? Can you keep it clean for the showings and the open houses and so forth? Um, and then lastly, can you keep everyone out of the house? Can you get them out of the house for the showings, including your pets? So of course, the more people, the more pets you have, the hardest, harder this can be sometimes. Um, but do you have the flexibility to be able to get out? And it could be a couple of hours. It could be most of a weekend, depending on how popular your house is and how many showings you get. So uh, mistake number three is having too much clutter or personal stuff around. 
And um, that can really, you know, the buyers need to be able to envision themselves in your house. And so you need to kind of take your home and make it back into a house so that somebody else can envision that house as their home is, is kind of the best way to think about it. Um, so some, some tips here, your closets, your cupboards, your drawers, the buyers are going to open them up. I know that sounds scary and you don't want them to, but they will. I can't tell you which ones they're going to open. They're not going to open them all. Um, but they're going to, you know, try to open your kitchen drawer to see if it's a soft close. If they can't get the door open because you have so many utensils in there, not good. Right. Um, they're going to open your, your cupboards to see like, okay, are these cupboard doors just painted or are they real or what's behind here? Um, so you don't want things falling at the closets. You don't want things falling out at them. You want it to look somewhat spacious. A good rule of thumb for like your clothes closet, for example, is to take out probably half of your clothes. You don't want it to feel overstuffed. You want them to feel like, wow, look at all this closet space. I can, I think I can fit all my stuff in here. So as much as you can declutter and just, you know, pr maybe prepack some of these items or take the chance to get rid of them. If you've got 10 spatulas, um, the, the better to kind of keep, again, make it look like you have more space than you do. Same goes for any countertops, any kind of a flat surface. So whether it's your bathroom vanity, your bedroom dresser, as much as empty as you can make that be, you know, like there might be a, a lamp or a book or something, but um, you want it to take, you know, your coffee pot, your toaster, your knife block, take all that and hide it away somewhere because um, once you put those items on the counter, usually there's not a lot of counter space left and you want them to walk in and feel like, wow, look at all this counter space, or I can see my own, like where I'm going to put my coffee pot, let them envision it themselves. Um, garage and basement, you have a little bit more leeway here. People are, you know, kind of expecting that you might have some storage, some boxes and so forth. So if, as you're decluttering, if you can't find an attic or, or if you can't do like an offsite storage for it or a friend's basement, you can put it in something like that, then it's okay to have it in boxes or totes, but the more organized it can look, the better and try to keep it kind of to one area of the house. So, you know, one corner of the basement or maybe one side of the garage. You don't want the entire garage to be full of stuff because they still want to be able to assess like, what does this garage look like? Can my car fit in there and things like that. So try to make it just as organized and as condensed as possible. Toys and paperwork, again, you know, you want that clean surface of your desk. You don't want them looking at your papers um, and just make it real, real uh, clean. Toys, if you can um, get rid of some of that, you know, hide them away. Um, one example, like in this house, they had this, they didn't have a lot of toys at all, but they had this basket of toys. That might be something that you want to throw in your trunk when, when you go for, the, when there's a showing, you know take that, have that stuff, like have it still available for the kids to play with, throw it in a laundry basket, throw it in a hamper and just throw it in the car when you go, um, when you step out for the showing, just to have it not be cluttering up the place. Um, so that's just a bit on decluttering, uh, personal items, religious items, you know, if you can take down pictures, um, anything that's really gonna make it feel like your home and not necessarily somebody else's, you wanna try to get that out. Um, Okay, so then the next question was around, how, do you have some place else to live? You know, maybe you have a lake house, maybe a family you can go live with, maybe you could rent someplace, maybe you could go to a hotel, something to be considered. So if you were to sell your house before you found another one, kind of what's the plan B? And of course, the more kids you have, the more pets you have, the more complicated this becomes. Um, it's a lot easier to just take yourself or maybe you and a partner to a, to a hotel. But um, when you've got three kids and five dogs, it's, it's uh, a lot more of a challenge. Um, and if you are going to have to move not directly from the place you own into your next place, it's probably going to mean putting your stuff in storage, unless that rental or that temporary location is big enough for you to store all of your stuff. You're probably going to look at putting your stuff in storage. You could do like a self storage where you're, you go and you put it in the unit yourself or, um, like some kind of pod or, um, smart box where you can fill it up in your driveway and they take it away and store it for you. Uh, until you're at your next location. Just a couple things to think about for that. There is, of course, a higher cost associated to that. So you're basically going to pay the movers to move the stuff from your house into the storage and then pay them again to move the stuff from the storage into your house. So your your mover cost is, is pretty much double. And then you're also going to have to pay a monthly storage fee. And that stuff that you put into storage, unless you're doing the self-storage option, if you put it in a pot or something, you need to be able to not have access to it until you move. Um, I think some moving places for a fee may be able to let you access it, but it definitely gets um, more complicated and probably adds costs. So just you have to 
pre-plan like what's, you know, don't put all your important paperwork into the storage unit because you're going to need that for closing kind of thing. Um, okay, so bring that all back together into this decision matrix. So the three black questions, you know, do you have the means to buy without selling first? And if your answer to that is yes, then your next question is, are you okay living in the house while it's listed? And again, either you are or you aren't. And if you are, then your best option is probably to find the house you want to buy first, get it under contract, get it, you know, maybe past inspections, like make sure you're kind of moving forward with that house uh, and then list your house while you're still living in it. Um, go ahead and list it, start showing it. And if you're lucky, you might get it sold before, um, you might get your proceeds before you even need to, to put the purchase by. But, you know, as soon, it, it just set, list it as, and try to get it sold as soon as you could. If you're not okay living in the house while it's listed, your best option is to buy first and go ahead and move out. Just move into the new place and then you can sell it vacant. Um, you could leave a few pieces of furniture behind strategically to kind of stage it. We could take pictures with some furniture in so it, it looks better and then it would just show empty. So there's some options there and it's not the end of the world um, if you don't have your stuff in there to, to sell it. So that's um, option two. And then back up to the top, if you don't have the means to buy without selling first or you just don't want to, then you have to consider, do you have that plan B for a place to go? Are you willing to move twice? And if you are, then... I would suggest selling first, and then you know what your proceeds are, you know exactly what you sold it for, and make your temporary move to wherever that may be, and then buy at your leisure. You know, when you find the place that you want, then buy it, you'll make that second move. If you're not, if you're not interested in moving twice, or have a, having a place to go, then um, your best bet is to sell first but buy immediately after. And you can, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but when you're selling, you can ask for some extended possession time that kind of gives you that wiggle room to go out and find something in the meantime, but you know what your proceeds are going to be and when you're going to get it. And you can time your buying to close after that. Uh, the other option that's not on here that's starting to become more common is to buy with a home sale contingency. So you're basically saying, I'm giving you a contract to buy your place, but it's contingent on me being able to sell my place. Uh, and then you hurry up and go list and sell your place. If there's multiple offers, the seller might not go for that. If it's the only offer that they're starting to consider that more. So that's more of an option um, than it was even six months ago. So I hope that helps you get your head around your strategy. And you really want, you don't want to be caught uh, on this where you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't think through this and now I don't have a place to live because I didn't time this right. And I am more than happy to, you know, that one couple I was telling you about that was building, I actually ran some scenarios for them. Like if you list before Christmas and you get this much possession time and it takes this long to get under contract versus after Christmas or even after the New Year's and what are the pros, what are the uh, risks, what are the advantages of, of of these different scenarios to help them think through and really time it up right for them. And it worked out perfect. So happy to, to work with you on your specific uh, situation. Okay. So like I said, that's a lot, but that's an important piece. You got to make sure that um, you have your strategy, whether you're buying or selling first and how you're going to, um, and whether you should even sell. <clears throat> okay. Step two is the pre preparation, hiring a realtor, doing any repairs or upgrading, getting your house staged. So uh, mistake number four is not working with a realtor. So I would be remiss to, to do this and not tell you why you should work with a realtor. Um, you, could you put a sign in the yard and sell it yourself? Yes. Um, it's likely to come with a fair amount of headache uh, and um, some potential security concerns. And uh, it could, it actually could end up um, not netting as much as if you worked with a realtor, which sounds counterintuitive because of course there's the commissions involved, but um, you know, we have the experience, we know the market conditions, we're gonna help you price it right. We're gonna get it marketed to the most people. So the more people that we can get interested in your house, the higher chance you're gonna get multiple offers and more competition and drive the price up and get the, the best offer. Um, we help you with the contracts to make sure that, that you're covered uh, legally, that um, everything looks good from that standpoint, but then also the negotiations. We know how to negotiate not only the contract, but the other thing is that getting under contract is one thing. Getting it from contract to close, there's a lot of things that can come up during that process with inspections, with appraisals, with the survey, with the title company, and so forth. So we are there to help negotiate and monitor and track all that and make sure that it goes smoothly 
and we're representing your best interest to help you get to the closing table on time and, and successfully. And then from a security standpoint, you know, if you sell on your own, you're at the risk of people knocking on your door, wanting to come see it. And, you know, you don't know these people, if they're pre-qualified, um, you know, letting them into your home, that, that could be a concern. So just a couple of thoughts about why you should hire a realtor to help you through this process. Okay, mistake number five is around uh, the condition of the home and the uh, repairs and renovations and so forth. So this is kind of multifaceted, which is not disclosing issues. You are required to disclose any kind of um, issues with the home, ignoring needed repairs or making costly renovations, like doing too much or not enough, basically. So um, this chart I put together with a local contractor about what updates should you make and kind of broke it down into buckets of like kind of must do to like nice to haves. And um, the must do's are any projects that are just plain incompleted. You know, you painted half the room and you stopped or, um, you know, there's trim only in part of the room kind of thing. So anything that's kind of half done, just get it done. Um, and then, you know, your regular maintenance and your cleaning, make sure that's all up to date, that you've like changed your filter on your furnace, because um, if you haven't, that's, it's going to be very noticeable when they pull that filter out and it's really dirty, right? Um, and it just makes them, it makes the buyer, when they see things like that, it makes them wonder, these people aren't taking good care of their house. What else am I going to find, right? So the little things can make a big difference from that standpoint. So the things in red at the bottom of this must-do list have to do with um, the, the lender appraisal is going to be looking for certain things, particularly if it's an FHA or VA loan. If they find some of these things, they're actually going to require you to make these updates in order for the loan to go through. So if you have these issues at your house, it's best to just address them up front and then you don't have to worry about it later. So that's peeling paint. They don't like peeling paint and that includes sheds, outbuildings, garages, as well as the house inside and out. Um, exposed wiring needs to be concealed, covered, not just no wires, just hanging out. Um, broken gutters, broken windows are gonna have to be either fixed or replaced. And then um, if there's missing handrails on stairs, that's a, considered a safety issue that's gonna get called out in the appraisal and you're probably gonna have to fix it. Some other things to consider doing are um, removing wallpaper. So most people are not a fan of wallpaper. Um, you know, it is making a comeback in some circles, but if it's dated grandma type wallpaper, um, most people don't like the look of it, one, but two, they don't like the idea of having to take it down. Um, so even though it seems like a simple enough thing, like, well, they could take it down and paint, they're not going to want to. Um, and particularly if it's in one of the first areas that they see when they walk in the home, it's in your foyer, it's in your kitchen, it's in your living room. Um, you know, maybe if it's in a bedroom or there's a border in a bathroom, it, it's not as bad as like a big area that's very visible. Um, I do have a great wallpaper removal lady. So if you have wallpaper, we can um, help you get that taken care of in advance. Um, consider painting if there's like a really brightly colored room, um, if it's unfinished or if there's any kind of like major staining or you can like see mold or mildew or something like that, then definitely you're going to want to paint. Um, but if it's, you know, your kid's room's pink or something, it's, you know, people might not want that, but if your kitchen's pink, then we, we're going to have a different conversation. So again, the main areas um, downstairs are probably the most important to make sure that the paint is um, fresh and, and neutral if possible. Landscaping, cleaning up your landscaping um, can go a long way. If your faucets have, you know, need some caulk on them, carpet, not necessarily need to update it, but if it's like visibly stained and, you know, try to do a, um, get it cleaned, that can go a long way. Um, but if there's a ton of staining in it, you may want to consider removing it and replacing it. Or if it's like really old, like shag carpet from the seventies. And then the other thing, like the front door, and I'll just call it the front entryway. Um, the buyers sometimes spend an inordinate amount of time at the front door. And by inordinate, I mean, like it might be two minutes while their realtor is trying to get the key out of lockbox and get the door open, but they don't spend like two minutes in any one small place in the whole rest of your house, right? Because they're moving, they're looking around or whatever. But those like two minutes that they're waiting for the realtor to open the door, they're looking around and they're like, oh, well, there's a crack in the siding or the, the doorknob's tarnished or the doorbell's broken or 
uh, there's cobwebs up in the corner or whatever, right? So like that, first impressions matter and they're spending a lot of time outside of your front door. Um, so if you are, you know, if, if the front door needs painted, like just pay real close attention to that area in particular. Um, don't bother, like don't do a major renovation, anything that like an addition, anything that's going to take a long time or cause financial strain. Like now is not the time to like completely redo your kitchen or anything like that. Um, and then from a bonus standpoint, if you can update the electrical, if you have an outdated electric box, um, if you're, if you get really old electric, that can go a long way. Maybe have your roof inspected just to check the condition of it and to see if there's any issues with the roof. The garage door is like one of the highest return on investments you can get for the cost that it takes to get a new garage door to like the appeal to the buyer and the value to your home, particularly if it faces the street. Because again, it's one of the first things you see. So if you pull up and there's like a big crack in your garage door, or may, it could mean that you just need to like paint it and get some new hardware for it, but you want that garage door looking nice. And that's something that you might want to consider replacing if it's in really bad shape. The hot water tank, if it's really old, those aren't too expensive. That might be something worth considering replacing. And then power washing um, your siding, your deck, your patio, even your driveway, if it needs it, um, that can go a long way to just really make things look um, fresh and from the outside. Um, okay, so that's getting the house prepped, ready to go. And then now we're ready to list it. So we're going to talk about pricing, um, getting it photographed, how we market it, how we do showings and open houses. So mistake number six, and this is probably really mistake number one in terms of like the worst mistake you can make, which is overpricing the home. And um, there's kind of a couple of different pricing strategies happening in this market right now where some people are like, you know what, I'm going to price it kind of like purposely low because I want to create this like circus in this bidding war and get all this excitement going for it. So maybe you do the homework and you think your house is worth like 225 and you're like, let's list it at 200. Now here's the pros and cons to that. That could work. You could get, you could generate a bunch of showings, get a bunch of exciting excitement. You could get a bidding war. Um, but it also could backfire. Maybe that doesn't, maybe you don't get all this craziness. And maybe somebody, you get one offer and it's for 200,000 and you're like, crap, like I really wanted 225. Well, how can you like, I mean, you can say no, cause that's your, your prerogative, but like, how are you going to say no to like, they gave you what you asked for. You have to kind of be willing to accept that. Um, and it could also, this sounds backwards, but it could deter some potential buyers because they're like, why is it priced so low? Like they're, they're kind of thinking what's wrong with this place or the neighborhood or something. Um, and it also sometimes attracts the wrong buyers. So there's buyers out there that are like really like 190 buyers or like maybe they could stretch to 200 and they're going to come see it and they're going to get all excited. Like, look at what I can get for 200. And they're going to put an offer in at 200 thinking like, this is great. I can offer you asking price when it's really worth 225 and somebody else is probably going to offer you 220 or 225. And those buyers are just going to get disappointed. And they were never really your buyer to begin with because that, that's just too far off, right? Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, people have been just like, hey, you know what? This market's crazy. Let's just like go 250. Like, why not? Let's just see what happens, right? And what could happen there is that you could get lucky. Maybe somebody comes in and offers you the 250. You're probably going to get a lot less showings, but maybe maybe it works out for you. Um, but more than likely, you're going to have to lower the price, uh, which makes usually takes longer to sell. And again, it could deter some potential buyers that they might just see like, I can tell that's overpriced. I'm just not even going to go see it. Um, some people want to price high because they, they think they need to leave room to negotiate to like come back down to the price they really want. Um, but, but buyers are, are going to see through that and they're just going to say, no, I don't think it's worth 250. So I'm just not going to go see it. So I'm more in the camp of like, kind of park it, price it as close to market value as you can try to attract as many qualified buyers that are in that price point to, that can afford your house and allow the market to determine the value. And, and truth be told, regardless of what you do, um, you know, I don't choose the price you don't choose. I mean, you choose what you want to list it at but you don't choose the price that it's ultimately sold at um, because it's the market and the buyer. It's the buyer that says, I'm willing to pay this for it. That's who dictates like what it's worth and what it's going to sell for. And, um, and you'll see pretty quickly if you, if you 
get it listed and you don't start seeing some showings, you've probably priced it too high or there's something wrong with the way it was listed. Um, and that the, the excitement, a lot of activity happens in those first couple of weeks. So you want to, you would definitely want to capture that. And the only other thing I'm going to say about pricing is that you should consider um, the price point. So if you are thinking like, I might want to list it at 200, don't list it at 202 because people search, they put a maximum in, sometimes a minimum, but always I would say a maximum when they're searching for their, they put in their search criteria. And they usually search by pretty even numbers, like 200, 225, 250. They're probably not searching like I can go up to 205. And so if you're like on the bubble of like, oh, should we do 200 or 203 or 205? You're probably better off just doing 200 because then you're going to capture anybody that put 200 in as, as their max. If anybody did put 200 in as their minimum, you're also going to capture them, which is one reason why I don't play the nines game. Because if you did 199.9, if they put 200 in as their max, they'll see it. But if they put 200 in as their minimum, they won't see it. So just something else to consider in terms of pricing. Okay, so then how do we get it marketed? This is kind of my one page marketing plan. It starts with setting up the listing with professional photography, which I think is really important. A lot of people, pretty much everybody is looking online and that's how they're seeing the house for the first time. And they're looking at those pictures to see if they're interested. So you do want some great pictures to really give a good impression. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, it's gonna go into the MLS which is going to then feed pretty much any other home searching website out there, whether it's Zillow, Realtor.com, Howard Hanna, EXP, Remax, any, any of the brokerages, you know, joeshomes.com, like whatever home search site is out there, the MLS is going to feed into that. And um, I also do for my clients a custom domain. So um, Ridgewood Lakes is, is a, a neighborhood in Fairlawn, for example. So RidgewoodLakeHomes.com that I can use to market it. And then you can tell your friends about it and things like that. And then from an advertising standpoint, of course, the, the sign in the yard, if, if you're um, willing to do that, or if, as long as you're, if sometimes condo associations have rules against it, but pretty typically we'll have a sign in the yard. Um, and then I do also reach out to the neighbors, whether that's through postcards to let them know that it was just listed. But with the way things have been moving so quickly in this market, it was like already under contract by the, by the time they got the postcards. So if I have the time, I'll actually door knock and let the neighbors know like, hey, your neighbor's house was just listed. I know this is a great neighborhood. You probably know somebody that's been thinking about moving into this neighborhood. Like a lot of people sometimes, you know, have a sister or a cousin or a coworker or a friend that's like, oh, I really love your neighborhood, would love to live there. Hey, can you let them know about it? So help spread the word through the neighbors. I'll run Facebook ads, which reaches tens of thousands of people locally to let them know about it. And then also market to other agents, either through brokers, open houses, inviting the agents to come take a look at the house or um, through something called reverse prospecting in the MLS, I can see which agents have clients that might have an interest in your home. If they favorited it and I see that they didn't schedule a showing, I'll reach out to them to say, hey, you have a client that's interested. Are you going to come see it? Things like that. Or if I know that they sell a lot in that area, I'll call them up and see if they have any clients for it, that kind of stuff. Um, and then showing the house, it, if you're willing, we can do an open house. I can host an open house, um, which will get some additional people in. It's always surprising to me the people that um, will come to an open house that, you know, I'm like, why aren't you just scheduling a showing with your agent, but maybe they're not working with an agent or they just prefer to come to the open houses. So that's it usually gets some additional folks in the door there. Um, and then all the showings are managed through a service called showing time where you can accept like, yes, I'm, I'm okay to leave the house at two o'clock because somebody's coming today and you'll see who's coming and when and their feedback and things like that. And then I'll also do some other analysis and feedback. I keep a close eye on, how your listing is doing compared to the competition. So, you know, maybe there's three other homes uh, for sale in that school district with a similar number of bedrooms, similar price points. Are they getting showings? You know, have they already gone under contract and you haven't? Um, I'll, I'll track how many like favorites you have on Zillow and how many I see in, on the MLS, how many um, people have viewed it and things like that. So, um, the things in black are kind of what every agent's going to do. And the things in red are things that I do that not every agent does that I feel like helps set me apart uh, with my service to my um, sellers. Okay, so uh, we talked about professional photography. These are just some um, example photos from my photographer. He does a great job. But I also go in and include written descriptions for the photos, um, particularly if there's confusion about like, is this, you know, what am I looking at here? 
because people really also want to understand like the flow of the house and like, is this on the first floor or the second floor, or is that the bathroom in the basement? So I'll take the time to kind of go in and write additional descriptions to make sure people understand the pictures and what they're looking at. And um, so mistake number seven is bad pictures. I mean, I've seen some really bad ones. And usually it's because they're not professionally photographed. And sometimes it's also because the home just wasn't properly decluttered or staged. And so um, I'm going to go through here. We're just going to get a little bit of levity here. Um, some pictures and why they're bad and kind of just let's let's learn from others' mistakes here. And these are all pictures that I pulled from our local MLS um, from like the Akron area. So um, what's wrong with this picture? You do not want to have your car in the driveway when they're taking um, the picture. And ideally, I would also move the garage or the um, garbage cans out of the picture and probably um, shovel the walk in this case. But um, here we've got toilets with the with the seat up and toilet paper sitting on the counter. Um, this is obviously, you know, this looks like a professional photograph, but they, they really should put that seat down. Um, this, this is just a bad photo with the angle and the light and, and whatnot. Um, on top of the fridge. So I'm guilty of this. I've got stuff on top of my fridge and I, with my height, I don't really see it or I, I just kind of look past it. Uh, but a camera is going to catch everything that's sitting on top of your fridge. So you want to take off anything that's on top of your fridge. Also like magnets on your fridge are the other thing that we sometimes like forget about. Um, but also, you know, medicine bottles on the counter. We've got some, some dishes here. You want to get all this um, clutter out of here. Um, window treatments and drapes, you typically want to have those open and open in a way that looks nice so that they're not like just pushed aside. Um, and, and the photographer can make adjustments if that's too much light, but typically you want those to be open. Mow your lawn, you know, have your landscaping kind of cleaned up a little bit. This is, this looks already like, okay, gosh, they don't take care of this house, right? Even if, even if you don't mow your lawn that often, mow it before the pictures. Um, and, and also the car sitting in the driveway there. Here, it looks like I probably couldn't even walk up to the front porch without getting attacked by one of those bushes. So um, you definitely want to make sure the path to the front porch is, is clear and you don't have trees and bushes and stuff kind of getting in people's ways and uh, poking their eyes out. Um, this just cracks me up that these are even pictures that got put in there, but you know, make your bed. Um, but under the bed is another spot where you're like, oh, I'll just hide some stuff under the bed. But if you don't have one of those nice like bed skirts, like again, the camera is going to capture that stuff um, depending on the angle of the picture. So um, make sure you you pay attention to that. It's either pushed back far enough that it won't be seen or you've got the bed skirt or, or it's cleared out. Um, this one, again, you know, there's a bunch of stuff on the counter and so forth. But the other thing you want to make sure is not to have any like obvious signs of pets. I mean, as soon as they walk in the door, they're probably going to figure out that you have a pet, but, um, don't put, don't have the dog bowl, the, the bird cage, the cat dish or whatever, like in the photos so that they know in advance that you have pets. Just try to hide that as long as you can. Um, this one just totally cracked me up. I'm looking through, looking through. I'm like, what the heck is that on the front porch? <laughs> I just put this in for comic relief. Like what? <laughs> don't get it like why would you put that and have this person in this like yeti costume or whatever it is um in your pictures and so if it wasn't funny enough that it was in that picture he was also in three other pictures <laughs> so so funny um i'm not sure what that did for helping to sell the house but not sure i would uh, i would suggest um ha having one of those in your picture Okay, so that gives you some ideas of what to do and not to do for um, your pictures. Mistake number eight, just while we're talking about showings and so forth, is poor showing availability. So you do have the ability to say in showing time, like, I can't do showings between 11 and 12 o'clock today or uh, anytime on Tuesday or, or whatever, right? And um, just try to be as flexible as you can with that because just know that if you have a buyer wanting to come see your house, you need to try to let them see the house when it's convenient for them. Um, because if like, for example, they wanted to come tonight and you don't allow it, maybe they're out of town for the weekend. And by the time they come back Monday, they've already like found another house that they like better that got listed over the weekend. Or maybe your house is already under contract, but you could have had more offers if you would have allowed them to come see it. So, you know, within reason, try to accommodate their requests or if for some reason you have to decline it. Um, 
give them some other options and try to try to work with the agent to get some other options um, as much as you can. Uh, it, you know, I've had instances, I've seen instances where it's like the amount of time they have blocked off is just so unreasonable that it's like, well, do you really want to sell your house? Because when can we come see it kind of thing? So just make sure you're, you're as flexible as possible with your showing availability. Okay, on to step number four. So you have it listed, you're showing it, people are coming to see it, and hopefully you're starting to get an offer or maybe you're fortunate to get multiple offers and you may have the opportunity to do some negotiations. So um, mistake number nine is taking the highest offer. So this may sound again, kind of counterintuitive, like, of course, why wouldn't you wanna take the highest offer? But we're gonna talk through how there's multiple facets to an offer. And particularly if you're in, a, a, if you're fortunate enough to get multiple offers, how you wanna weigh those out and consider them. So um, this is kind of my one pager on multiple offer situations and the different levers that you may see in an offer. And these four at the top have to do with how much is the buyer willing to pay for it and how are they gonna pay for it? And um, from a price standpoint, you know, the market was, I was basically telling my buyers, like, if this is the first, and I still do, if this is the first weekend on the market and you really want this house, you're probably going to have to offer asking price. The sellers are probably not willing to accept less than that at that point in time. Um, but if you know there's multiple offers, you're probably going to have to go at, above ask and you may want to consider an escalation. So an escalation is like bidding on eBay. So you're basically going to say, you know, hey, if the if the asking price was 200 um, I'm going to offer you 200, but I'm willing to go up to 220,000. And then you offer an increment and it's by increments of, let's say $3,000 over the next best offer. So maybe there's another offer that comes in at 210 that basically makes your offer into 213. So you're able to beat them out by an additional $3,000. Um, so you may see multiple offers and one of them escalating against another one. In terms of how they're paying for it, cash is usually king. Sellers like cash because they don't have to worry about the loan going through and they don't have to worry about the appraisal. Um, you want to make sure that you're checking that they, ha they have a proof of funds, that they actually have the cash that they're saying they have. Um, but I wouldn't be necessarily afraid of, of an, another offer that's higher um, or has some other favorable terms with a loan. Um, you know, we can do our homework on how solid the, the they are as a borrower and how good the lender is and stuff like that. But typically beyond cash, the next preferred option is usually a conventional loan. And if it can be with a trusted and reliable lender, which we can help you understand who those are. Um, and then less preferred from a seller standpoint is usually FHA and VA. And that's simply because there's a, a higher standard of appraisal that like an inspection that happens with the appraisal where they may ask you to make some repairs and stuff like that. And again, depending on the condition of your house, that really may be a non-concern. Um, and we can help you understand whether, like how big of a risk that is or how big of a concern that is for your particular situation. Um, and then earnest money, pretty much the standard is 1% of the purchase price. And it's typically refundable if the buyer walks away for certain reasons. So if it's a $200,000 house, it's $2,000 of earnest money that goes to the title company. It just becomes part of the buyer's down payment. It doesn't like add anything to your proceeds or anything like that, but it's just showing that they're serious and they're putting up money up front towards, towards that contract. And then the closing costs, um, we are starting to see more where the buyer is asking the sellers to help pay for part of their closing costs. And um, this took me a while to wrap my head around because my first instinct, and it may be yours as well, is like, well, I got a lot of my own selling, like closing costs. Why would I want to pay some of theirs? Um, and really how you should think about it as a seller is the buyer is asking you to help pay for your closing costs because they don't have the cash to do it. And they, um, it's a way to basically loop those closing costs into their loan. And so if they're asking for them, they probably need them. And you need to just really look at what your net proceeds are going to be for it. So if you're asking 200,000 and they offer you 200,000, but they want you to pay $5,000 in closing costs, your net is, <clears throat> excuse me, is 195. That's still a better offer than somebody that's offering you 190 without any closing costs, right? So you just have to kind of look at the nets and compare net to net and um, understand that piece of it. So those are the four things having to do with price. There's two things having to do with the date and there's two separate dates. They can be the same date, but they don't have to be, which is the closing date and the possession date. So the closing date is the date that you're gonna sign the paperwork, you're gonna get the proceeds, the deed's gonna be filed, it's officially gonna like go into the buyer's name and it's not gonna be your house anymore. 
the possession date is the date that you hand over the keys for the buyer to move in. And, you know, kind of standard is that that would be the same day. And then it might be about 45 days from the day you go under the contract, under contract until the day that you close and take the buyers take possession and you move out. Um, but what's been happening with the market being so hot as it was, is that the closing has been happening quicker. So it's become pretty standard to do a 30 day close. Uh, if they have cash, it could be quicker. But then also, in some cases, the sellers are saying, I want to stay in the house an extra couple of days, a couple of weeks, and it could be a couple of months. So that example I gave you earlier about this couple that was building and they put their house for sale before Christmas, they actually negotiated, I think they did like a 45 day close and then an additional two months of possession. So they were able to get the proceeds from their sale before they needed to give them to their builder. And that two months basically bought them the wiggle room to make sure that the home was going to be ready for them to move into so they wouldn't have to move twice. And I think they ended up moving out about two weeks sooner than the two months, but it gave them that flexibility. And because it's still predominantly a seller's market, because the inventory is so low, if that's something that you need or is important to you, you can ask for it and you're probably going to get it. Um, if the buyer really wants the house, as long as they have the flexibility to give it to you, they're probably going to be willing to allow you to stay in an extra period of time. It's kind of like you're renting back your own house, but usually it's for free. They may charge you, but in a lot of cases, they do this rent back for free. Um, so that can give you some flexibility, um, particularly if you're trying to sell first and then buy. Um, but if you're already moved out or you, you're okay to move out on possession date, that's fine too. Um, but you just have to make sure that you're in line with whatever, whatever goes on that contract that those dates work for you. And then the last three things are around contingencies. So the contract is usually contingent upon something and, and oftentimes multiple things, meaning there's these things have to happen in order for the contract to go through. And the inspection is a big one. Um, it's been pretty standard that a, a real estate contract is contingent upon passing a general inspection. But with the way the market's been so hot, there were buyers willing to waive inspections. That's still happening in some cases. Or in other cases, they may say this contract is contingent upon passing inspections, but um, I'm not going to ask for you to make any repairs or change the price or anything like that. So that's kind of the in-between that's happening. The other consideration is the timeline. So how long are they going to take? How long is that inspection period? And if you have one offer that says they're going to do their inspections in the next 10 days and another offer that says they can do them in five days, all, all else being equal, the five days is better for you because if it are if, if there is going to be an issue uncovered in the inspection, the sooner you can find that out and... Um, address it, the better, because and, and maybe the buyer's gonna walk away, but the, the quicker you can find that out, then the quicker you can get it back in the market. So, um, you know, just that's a minor thing, but something to consider. And then the other um, pretty standard contingency is the appraisal. So if they're getting, if the buyer's getting a loan, the lender is gonna require that that appraisal comes in at or above the purchase price. So if they're loaning you $200,000, they want to make sure it's worth at least $200,000. And if the appraisal comes back and says it's worth one ninety five, dollars then we have something called an appraisal gap. And if you are in a multiple offer situation and you're worried about it being getting appraised, so maybe your list price was two hundred, dollars and you have this offer for two twenty five, dollars and you're like, oh, that might be pushing it. Like we really thought it was kind of worth two hundred, dollars maybe two ten. dollars um, You can ask them if they have additional money to cover that gap. Because if there's a gap, Basically, either you're going to have to lower your price to the number so that the loan can go through, or the buyer is going to have to have that additional money at closing table in cash, which probably a lot of times they don't have. Um, or maybe there's an in-between that you meet in the middle. Or worst case, if you're not willing to um, negotiate this, the buyer could walk away. So um, it, you know, it may happen. Um, but if you're in multiple offer situations and you're concerned about it appraising, that may be something you want to try to negotiate. And if it's cash, that's another reason why cash is good, because usually there's no appraisal. Occasionally, if there's a loan and they're putting a huge amount of money down, the, the lender will waive the appraisal. So that could happen as well. And then lastly, it's contingent upon sale of another home. So um, that that is becoming more common. Uh, to see this, of course, if you're looking at multiple offers and one of them's contingent upon the buyer selling their own home and one's not, the one that's not is a lot less risky for you as a seller because you don't have to like worry about the domino effect of them selling their house and what if their inspection falls through or their buyer's loan falls through or something else happens, right? Um, 
But if it if you are considering a contingency, you just want to find out as much information as you can about where what they're doing with their listing. Is it already listed? Is it past inspections? Is it past appraisal? Um, is it financed? Or if it's not listed yet, when are they going to list it? At what price are they going to list it? To just estimate what your risk is with accepting that offer. Um, and it, you know, a lot of times it works out fine, um, but just something you really want to understand. And if you have other options, something you're going to want to weigh. So that's a lot, but I just want to let you know up front kind of some of the different things we're seeing with offers in this market and how to kind of assess them and, and weigh them against each other. Okay, so getting down to the end here, uh, we talked already about some of these contract contingencies, but um, mistake number 10, the last mistake here is not being willing to negotiate. So whether that's willing to negotiate on the price or um, on the inspections, on the appraisal, there's multiple points during the process where negotiations come into play. Um, but I put together this one pager on, um, in particular, inspection negotiations, and basically trying to drive to, should the seller make the repair? If, the, if there's something comes up in the inspection and there's gonna be an ask, should the seller make the repair before closing or let the buyer make the repair after closing? And if the buyer makes the repair after closing, are you going to give some kind of price concession or a closing cost credit? So that's basically the three kind of ultimate things that are going to happen is either you're going to pay for the repair and get it done before closing and provide a, a receipt for it, or you're going to negotiate a price reduction or a closing cost credit. And then it's going to be the buyer's issue to deal with once they take possession. And um, the, the questions that you have to consider here, and it's really more on the buyer, is like, how much control do they want to have over it? Do they want to hire the contractor and like oversee it and make sure it's done in the way that they want it to be done? If so, then, then they probably should explore the option of the purchase price reduction or the closing cost credit. And really the difference between those two things is whether or not they have the cash. So a closing cost credit is essentially giving them cash in their pocket because they presumably had that money to bring to closing in cash. And if you give them a credit, then they can take that money they were going to pay towards closing and use that towards the repair. If they have extra cash beyond the closing costs, they may prefer a purchase price reduction because then their mortgage would be lower and they can use their extra cash to make the repair. It's pretty much, you know, uh, six and one half dozen of another from, from a seller standpoint, it's more of does the buyer have the cash or not? Um, and then if the buyer is kind of like not sure or they really don't care if they want control over it or not, um, the other things to consider is, you know, is it a pretty straightforward fix and like a pretty set expense like it's it's you know this is the only way to fix it and it's going to cost two thousand dollars give or take no matter what or it's like oh gosh i don't know like it could be a five thousand dollar repair or a fifteen thousand dollar repair because once they do x they might find out why and there could be all this other stuff so that might be more concerning from a buyer standpoint to say i'm going to worry about this later because it could be bigger than they expected they may want you to make the fix if that's the case um, and then the other consideration is could it actually get fixed before closing contractors are hard to schedule, you know, if, if it's hard to like get it done before closing and you don't want to push closing out, that may be a scenario where you let the buyer take it on after closing. But some other considerations is that the lender may require that it get fixed before closing or that money's held back to make sure that that gets fixed. Because again, this is, they're loaning you money for this asset that's like, you know, they've got skin in the game here and they want to make sure that it gets done. Um, and then if you don't have um, the cash to make the repair, there could be some options to have title hold back some of your proceeds in escrow to, to have the reimburse the buyer to have the buyer do it later. So if the lender approves it. So I know that's a lot, but just kind of giving you a flavor of what might happen with um, inspection negotiations. And then um, now we're getting down to the final steps, closing and possession. So closing, you know, usually the buyer and the seller are going to sign separately at your convenience, at a location of your convenience. As a seller, you can sign a couple of days in advance. It doesn't have to be necessarily on closing day. The buyer is going to transfer their money into title, which is a, the down payment, their closing costs. The lender is going to approve that. And then um, the deed's going to get signed and the mortgage taken to the courthouse to be filed. And so the key takeaway here is it's not officially closed until the until that's filed at the courthouse. And so even though you signed in the morning and the buyer already transferred their their um, money over and the buyer already signed, it's not closed until that happens, which can sometimes take you know several hours. So we have to wait for that official word from title that it's been um, the deed's been filed in order to hand over possession. 
Closing costs, high level. Uh, this is what the buyer pays versus what the seller pays. Some of them are split. And the things in red are required by the lender. Total all in, you, you can estimate around 6 to 8% of the purchase price is what you are going to pay as a seller in closing costs. That would include the commissions, the title fees, um, title insurance, all that good stuff. But I will. I, I run estimated net sheets when I meet with you to say, if we think it's going to sell at this price, this is what you would net. At this price, it would be this. So you can get a better idea there. Um, and then possession. Like we talked about, that could be the same day. It could be a couple of weeks or a couple of months later. A couple of things to note here. Don't wait to the last minute to schedule your movers and try not to schedule it for the day of possession because it's not, although we work really hard to close on time, it's not uncommon for that to move by maybe a day or two days. And you don't want to be hung with like, oh my God, the movers are coming, all my stuff. What am I going to do? Like, just give yourself a little bit of wiggle room and don't schedule it for that exact same day. Make sure you change your address with the post office, on your bills, all that good stuff. Leave the house as clean as possible. You know, don't leave your trash. Um, window state treatments typically stay. If you if you um, said you were leaving the refrigerator, or the washer and dryer, make sure you leave what you said you were going to leave and don't leave stuff that you didn't talk about. So don't just be like, oh, I think maybe the buyer wants to have my rake or like whatever. Like make sure that they that's something they actually want. Um, and just, you know, it doesn't have to be spot, like completely spotless, but just a nice courtesy sweep the floors and wipe the counters. And it's not like just completely dirty when they walk in would be um, the preference there. Transferring utilities, you're going to provide the information to your realtor, and then the buyer is going to request to have um, those transferred on the day of possession. And then usually, at least the way I do it, I just have you leave the keys in the lockbox and extra keys on the counter. And then once we get word that it's okay to transfer possession, that it's officially filed, I just give the other realtor the lockbox code, they give it to their buyer, they go deliver the keys to the buyer, and then I stop back and pick up the lockbox later. So that's it. All right, we made it. You've sold your house. Hopefully you've avoided all these big 10 mistakes. Um, not trying to time the market, not having that strategy to, to buy and sell seamlessly, having too much clutter, not hiring a realtor or picking the wrong agent, trying to make making the wrong updates or too many updates or ignoring some of the, the major um, issues or not disclosing the issues, overpricing the home or not being realistic about the market and the condition of your home, having bad photos, poor showing availability, taking the highest offer or an unwilling to negotiate with buyers. So I hope this helped you understand the process and the mistakes to, to watch out for. And are there any questions? No questions, but just really rich and valuable information that I think, again, even if you sold a house before and bought a house before this is stuff that we don't do every day that kind of gets forgotten mm -hmm. and um I just yeah great 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 information thank you Lisa I appreciate it um our next webinar is April 19th on home appraisals so I'm actually partnering with a local appraiser who is also a realtor and we are going to just talk through the appraisal process and kind of how it works and, and what you need to know there so Hope you can join us again next month. If not, you can look for the replay on the YouTube channel. Thank you.